I do get a lot of messages online. They're like, uh, when they see my car, they're like, oh, it's daddy's money. Even in person, like I was at in and out the other day and I was pulling out of the driveway and some kids, like young kids, they're like, oh, he must have daddy's money. And I heard it. I was like, they don't know the whole story, man. Like they don't know the struggles I went through. They don't know like I was homeless for like three weeks. They didn't know I was living in a mud house when I was a kid, you know? We're live. Mo Capital's in the building. What up, Mohammed? What's up, man? How are you? Good to see you. Living the dream, man. It's great you pulling Thank up you. in the GTR. <laughs> if you follow your stories, you're mm -hmm. always just having a good time. You're yeah. always like building that culture. Mm -hmm. You seem to be really good at building culture. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, like what I try to do is have fun every day, uh, especially like uh, nowadays, a lot of people try to pitch like sales, like people will skip your story on Instagram if you try to always pitch them, right? If you see my story, always trying to like sell a course or anything like that, you're not going to watch my story. So I always try to have fun, keep it entertaining. A lot of people are like, yo, I watch your story like it's Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> but dude, I mean, we've known each other for a decently short period mm -hmm. of time right now. So yeah. you live with Jan Stavisky, who is on yeah. the podcast, mm -hmm. and you basically live in this massive house in and what part of LA? Uh, Arcadia. Arcadia. So you live in a mansion with all the homies yeah. <laughs> and with people that are employees and you guys all have these exotic cars and yeah. you all just work off each other in terms of just creating a great environment. Mm -hmm. And it's really inspiring. And just the few times I've hung out with you, I get so much value from the courses you've taken, from the people you've talked to. Mm -hmm. You're just always moving forward. You're building this incredible business. You have the most insightful information i know from anybody in my experience on drop shipping in the amazon business and you're doing a lot of stuff we're going to jump into that yeah but man i just want to say congratulations it's Thanks. pretty incredible appreciate it man i mean it's crazy how your life can change within two years to be honest with you, i started my entrepreneurship journey two years ago and i've been sleeping on it for a while <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean two years ago so what what were you doing before then so uh like everyone else you know i used to have a nine to five job uh living paycheck to paycheck um, I used to, I worked from Apple to Zara, um, Tesla was my last job, which was the best job I ever had. And, you know, I used to wake up every day, work weekends because it was a retail store. So it was in the mall and I couldn't spend, uh, time with my girlfriend at the time cause she was off weekends. And I just woke up one day. I was like, I really need to do something. I'm 26 at the time. And I couldn't even, um, I was like, I can't do this until I'm like, what, 50, 60. I'm not going to work at the mall. I had a degree, right? Believe it or not, everyone almost I worked with at Apple had a bachelor degree, had a master's degree. They were still working retail for, what, like $15 an hour, which is crazy nowadays, right? Back in the days when, you know, someone had a bachelor or master's degree had a decent yeah. job. So that's why I was like, I really need to do something. You know, I spent five years in college. Uh, went to FIU, Florida International University. Shout out to Panthers. Shout out. <laughs> and I had a great time. It was a great experience. I think I only did it because my parents were pushing me to. But at the same time, I think all the things that I went through in my life set me up for this. So I don't really regret it. But at the same time, I wish I went into entrepreneurship. Someone took me to a Grant Cardone's 10X event when I was 18 to open my eyes, right? And I wish I had a mentor like me when I was 18 because I would have grown so much more. You said you went to that event, the, the 10X event, and that's yeah. really kind of unlocked a lot of doors for you? Yes, correct. Do you think it was the event itself or was it a certain speaker that said something? Like what part of the event actually did that? So I used to listen to like a lot of Gary B, right? Yeah. And then, and then someone, one of my friends was like, oh, you should also check out Grant Cardone. He lives in Miami, like in our neighborhood, basically. And I checked him out and he was having this big event with like 50,000 people. I was like 50,000 entrepreneurs, like something must be, people are doing something right. I could find at least one person that could be like doing maybe drop shipping, real estate, whatever it is. So that event, I think all alone, I didn't even, to be honest with you, I didn't even listen to the speakers <laughs> at that time. This year I did, but last year, what I was doing is that they had um, everybody was like hanging around uh, in the back area where they were getting food in the stadium. So I was just talking to people. Those three days, I was just networking. 
And I was just networking with people that are doing different things or want to be entrepreneurs or they had a small business. And I was like, wow, this is great. Like a lot of people didn't have a job. I was like, imagine me not having a job and then doing my own thing, wake up whenever I want, not um, going into work at someone else's schedule that made for me. And I'm like, to be honest with you, I feel like nine to five is like a modern jail, right? And people are trying to get out of it because they can't because they have to uh, pay bills. You know, we're the only species that has to pay to live in this world. How crazy is that, right? <laughs> so, and I thought a lot, of, I just woke up one day, I was like, I just need something like a fire in me, right? Yeah. And I just woke up one day and what I did differently than I didn't do before, I did something every day to improve going into this 95 to entrepreneurship. Is it open an LLC or make a phone call or send someone a text message? Just one thing. And then it, it graduated to like where I had my own business, lost like $35,000 in a single year. And I didn't give up. That's the main thing. Like, guys, like if you open your own business, don't get discouraged. Because um, a lot of people are not successful in their first, second or third business, right? Then you find that one where it's going to make you a lot of money. Like, I forget the names of most successful people. I mean, they started from their garage, right? Microsoft, Google. And those people um, actually started a business before and it failed. So for them to what they are now, it's kind of crazy. It's like insane. I, and I look at myself now, I was like, whoa, if I gave up, I would be still working at that Tesla inside the mall doing test drives. <laughs> it's interesting because there's nothing wrong with some of these jobs. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of them provide a great living. Yeah. But the whole idea of entrepreneurship which is very satisfying and exciting is yeah. even though you're going to be working way more hours as an entrepreneur than a nine to five you just there's so much more financial upside and no matter how you spin it whether you're a big time account executive at a massive company and you're making great money yeah no matter what the, the company is going to be making a lot more income than you are exactly. so it's like being the person that puts that pieces together there's just so much more financial upside so obviously it's great for people that are working a job right now to mm -hmm. fuel their future. I think that's completely like admirable. And that's kind of what you did. Yeah. Um, and then you took off and started this business. And now, I mean, dude, yeah. <laughs> two years later, holy crap. Yeah. And the cr crazy thing is that I kind of used the nine to five to get out of the situation. Nine to five is not bad, but you can use that to fund your business. So for a whole year, I remember as a full-time student, this was my like last semester of school. I was like, I need to do something. So what I did uh, when I used to work at Tesla, I took, um, I was like uh, full-time. But I used to do like 35 hours a week. Then I, I got a second job at a grocery store. And then I was working there on the weekends. And at night, I did Uber because I used to have like a little nice Lexus. And I did Uber Black. And you love driving. I love driving, especially Miami, right? So um, like I used to do Uber Black, Uber Black. Like if I took a client on Uber Black, it was like $50 like for like a five minutes drive. So it, w it was like, I was like, whoa, this is really good because I was making money and I was downsizing on a couple of things. So for a whole year, I took, I went to full-time school and had three jobs and used that to pay out my debt because I spent a lot of money in Dubai at my brother's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Big mistake. Uh, and then after that, um, I paid everything off, got my credit score up, and then I applied for credit cards that had no interest rate for 12 months. So I applied for like five of them, got like $30,000 within all that and then i used that to get into my atm business that was my first business so you, you went in just made some simple applications to some credit cards that had zero exactly. percent apr for the first year you mm -hmm. have access to all this capital aka mo capital exactly and you decide to start this atm business mm -hmm. what sparked the idea of starting an atm business so i saw an ad online and um you remember the, the grocery store i used to work at I saw a guy come in and fill up the ATM. It was an older guy in his sandals, shorts, and tech top, tank top. I was like, I, I was like, kind of like surprised that he was filling up the ATM because he didn't look like he worked for the bank. So I, I approached him. I was like, hey, why are you filling this ATM up? Is it yours? He was like, yeah, it's my, it's my business. I was like, surprised. I thought only banks can own ATM. Then when I saw the ad, I was like, I can do this. So I bought a course online. It was on YouTube. Everyone else, like, I bought a course to educate myself. It did help, right, to start my business. But I 
it didn't find a way to scale it or learn everything about it, right? So a couple of months later into the business, guess what? The guy that I talked to, I replaced that ATM with my own ATM because I was really close to the owner of the grocery store. So that's how I started the business. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. That's yeah. the bystander effect. Mm -hmm. You're looking at it, you see an opportunity. Yeah. Everyone else saw the same opportunity, exactly. but you jumped on it. Why mm -hmm. was that? Why do you think you did it and not everyone else? It's because I saw how passive it was and, and it's very lucrative business because it, today, if you go and ask 10 people, right? Eight people will say, hey, I didn't know you can own your ATM business. Ask them, hey, do you know you can own an ATM and put it in a grocery store, a gas station, or a strip club, which is the best place to put it? <laughs> and people didn't know, right? So you can create an LLC, right? Uh, you don't even have to get a license. You don't even have to get a permit because you're doing business to business. You're putting your ATM inside the, inside the location. You can even find a contract online. How crazy is that, right? ATM contract, Google it, you'll find it. Uh, but I will still get a lawyer to oversee everything. But it's the easiest business to get into, especially if you have some cash flow coming in and you can scale the business with your credit. And uh, the reason I did it uh, is like, I have to fill up the ATMs once a week, right? And I can fill up all of them in a day. So I have six days free to go into another business. You do that manually? I do them manually. So you yeah. roll in with like a bag of cash? Yeah. If you go to my Instagram, you'll see that. <laughs> so I used to do that before. Now I have employees set up. So my employees fill it up now. They take screenshot every time they would draw money. They send me when they upload. So I have them on commission and hourly. So then when they close their own location, they get a, like a big commission for it. So I also pay, like if it's like a strip club or a gas station, I pay something up front to replace the current ATMs. So imagine if you're, it's like this grocery store, if they don't have an ATM and you put an ATM, you're just going in blind, right? You don't know how many tra transaction is gonna do. So me, when I go to the location, if I see an ATM, the owner has a, a, the, has a transcript of how much transaction it did last month. So based on that, I make a decision of, hey, I'll give you a better service, I'll give you a brand new ATM, and I'll also give you more money on your percentage. So that's how I close them. You just up, it's just that simple. Exactly. And it's like yeah. no brainer for them. Exactly. What do yeah. they typically make on it? Uh, 30 to 50%, believe it or not. So just because I'm renting that place, you know, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really give them like a guaranteed money because that's a big mistake. I would only give them percentage from your earnings because it kind of guarantees your income too. How many ATMs do you have up now? Uh, right now we have 39. 39. Yeah. And just scaling. And just scaling, yeah. What's like the average profit on an ATM? So in a location like a grocery store, gas station, you would make around four to $500, depending on where it is. Is that a year or a month? That's a, that's a monthly. Monthly. Yeah. And then if you put it, my highest location right now, uh, believe it or not, is in a strip club. It's 24 hours. It's in the heart of Miami called Club 11. And I have three ATMs there, and it generates anywhere between fourteen thousand to twenty-two thousand dollars a month, and that's in transaction. In cash, they would draw about one point two million dollars a month. Think yeah. about that; it's crazy. Was that one of your first ones? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow! So that's like the gold mine of all ATMs, right yeah. there. Yeah, and the the crazy story about it is that, um, I mean. I didn't know the owner, so I had to find someone that knew the owner of the strip. So I used to go to the strip club all the time to find out who the owner is. Then I found a bouncer, right? And I talked to him, I was like, hey, here's a hundred bucks. Can you connect me with the owner? So he actually connected me, not with the owner, but the manager. Then I talked to him and what I did in my meeting, I wrote a $5,000 check in their name. And I, uh, it was basically, I was like handed to them on, on the meeting. It's like, this is how much I will pay to put my ATM here for you to replace the current ATMs. So if you put money like that up front, nobody's going to say no, right? Yeah. So it's, it's like a closing tactic, right? So I closed them right then and there. They, I replaced the ATM within a week. And then I can, I like all my friends like that go there, be like, hey, man, you're charging 10%. So I don't charge a transaction fee. I charge a percentage. So um, when, when you draw $500, the fee is $50. So it's really high. I mean, it's a strip club. So let's say if you went to um, if you went to a strip club and you're trying to get more money because people run out of money, right? And you're not gonna go back to your car, go to your bank, and withdraw money if you're with your friends, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna withdraw that money and pay that fifty dollars fee, right? So that's how I see. That's how I know people will 
would draw money, especially like if you're in a strip club. Broke people don't go to strip club. If True. They, and if they have money, they will draw that money for sure. What's like the downsides of the ATM business? The downsides, I would say, right, I mean, coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's still people are withdrawing money. Um, if someone breaks breaks into the ATM, that's the that's the downsides. But you only see that it's very rare if that happens. I've been in the business for two years and nothing happened to my ATM. I mean, uh, someone kind of broke uh, one of my lever, but like it was like he got drunk and then he kind of like pushed the ATM, but that was it. Um, we have a lot of securities. They're bolted to the ground. All my ATMs are bolted, so they can't really take it. Um, the I'll say another downside would be if the ATM is not getting that much transaction. But my contract I put in there uh, within two weeks, uh, and if it's a month, if it doesn't get more than two hundred transaction, they have two weeks to re- uh, I can replace the ATM. So it's great because you're not losing any money. You have no just, downside. Yeah. yeah, you just replace the ATM to another location that would do good. Like I wouldn't put it on like nail salon. Um, like barbershop, I would do it if they only have like more than 10 barbers, right? Because it's a busy location if they have 10 barbers. Um, one of the greatest way to know if the location is busy, uh, this is all, all, in, all in the courses too, but I'll give you guys this free. I mean, you can use this for a lot of other things. So wh- the way I see it, if you get traffic in the location, at least 1% of the people uses the ATM, right? So if I go to a grocery store, I did this before live on, for YouTube, I was like waiting in my car for like 15 minutes. Then uh, I'm going to pull out my calculator real quick to show you guys. So if you count about like, let's say 20 people walked into the grocery store, yeah. right? In 15 minutes, then you walk in inside the grocery store, buy a coffee or candy, and you count how many people comes in, let's say another 15 people. So in 30 minutes, you have 35 people walking in and out, right? Times that by two, which is an hour now. So which is 70 people open for 16 hours, that's about 1,100 people. So that's about 11 transactions at 1%, right? So if you do that 11 times $3, that's $33 a day. In a month, that's $990. So that's how I do my research when it comes to location and how busy it is. And by the way, that's not counting the weekends, but weekends are crazier, right? People go out more, people go to the grocery store, so that's how I kind of do my research to see if the location is good for me or not. Then I look at also the transaction from the last ATM, if we'll get more transaction from that. This might be a silly question, but mm-hmm. this bit, um, the way you're describing this makes it seem like this is a no-brainer. Everyone yeah. should be doing an ATM business. Yeah. Why isn't everyone doing an ATM business? Because I would say, I mean, n- not a lot of people know about it. It's a lucrative business. Like I said, if you ask people, 10 people today, they wouldn't know they can own an ATM business unless they seen an ad or they know someone that's doing it, right? Uh, it's so lucrative that I got pushed back from uh, the ATM community saying that, hey, why do you have a course? Because this is going to kill our business. But if you think about it, I don't, I don't see people as competition, right? I lived in Miami at the time. And if I can teach this someone who's 18 straight out of college, if he had $5,000, he can buy his first ATM for $2,000 and fill up $3,000 every week on his ATM and recycle the cash, that's a passive income for him. That's better than any other job he can get. That's better than him. That's better than actually going into a school. If he's not passionate about something, he just wants to make money. Uh, My best advice, if you're over 18 or if you're 17, getting out of high school, if you want to make money, for me, like the way it's my opinion, I don't think you should go to school. I think you should start a business. I think you should start flipping iPhones, right? There's, there's 20, 30% margins in that, which is crazy. I think you should do garage sale or go into your offer up and Craigslist, go into the free section that people are giving. Like a lot of people when they move out, right? If you can't sell this desk, you're, going to my, you're moving to Miami, you're gonna give this out on the last day, right? Yeah. Where are you gonna put it? So I would take this table, I'll make it a little bit nicer, shinier, go to Home Depot, buy something that will make it really nice and sell it for like 40, 50 bucks. And there are people are doing that and they have a six figure business by doing that. They have a little truck, they invest it too and now they can get more. That's like the Gary Vee thing with the yeah, mattresses. Exactly. People and give free mattresses all the time. You can just go and flip them. Exactly. And not only that, that you will make money and you will be healthier because you're moving more throughout the day. You're lifting furniture, right? So that's how I see it. If I were to go broke today, I have $0 in my bank account. 
that's what I would do. I would go to the free section, buy a lot of, oh, not buy, sorry, you're getting it for free, and then, and then sell that online because like when I do uh, my Amazon business, I'm basically the middleman, finding buyers through sellers. That's what it is. Everybody is a salesperson. Even Grant Cardone is a salesperson. Gary B has a product too. He's a salesperson. Even the president, he has to sell himself, right, to create, a, to pass a bill. Everybody, if you're a billionaire, they have to be a salesperson to sell themselves to get the next deal, right? Right. Yeah. Dude, I love listening to you speak. Yeah. I mean, you, you can just go and go and go. Your passion yeah. is insane. Thank you. Because you've seen it. You've lived with so many people and not just lived in your house, but yeah. you've you've your circle is all doing this. Mm -hmm. You've created a circle of people that are doing these things every single day. So your belief level is out of control. Yeah. That's something I found recently is that ever since I've started just completely focusing on only connecting with, you know, high net worth individuals that are making moves. I quickly realized that a lot of these people aren't that much more maybe intelligent or qualified than I am. They just have a plan, a better plan, and yeah. they're putting it into action. And it's the margins are insane. Yeah. Most people just don't know it's possible because their vision's not big enough exactly. and they don't demand more. You know what I mean? True. Yeah, that, that's the thing. Like I wasn't the smartest kid in the school. Like people think like, because I have these businesses, they think I'm super smart. I'm actually, I'm not that smart, guys. I used to have like a 2.9 GPA in high school. Then in college, it was probably lower. I don't know how I graduated. I wasn't like really focused. I was doing, I was running track and I did soccer. That was my two main sports I was really focused on. So um, one of the things is that um, I just found a way and I made plans and I just stuck to it. I had goals. I had short-term goals. Then I had long-term goals. Those short-term goals that I set up and I finished, what it set me up to the bigger goals I had and I, I was able to finish those. So if, if you're young, uh, I don't know how big is your audience, but if you're young and if you're listening to this, have an action plan. Do something every single day that will improve your life. Because... You only live once, right? And you want to have that lifestyle of traveling. Like for my business right now, I can take a laptop. I don't even need a laptop. I just need an iPhone to travel and my business will be running. Imagine having a business and it's running in the background. You won't even have to worry about um, about uh, like going into work or if you have to take time off or you'll get the vacation hours. Trust me, I've been through that. A lot of entrepreneurs, like they've been entrepreneurs since they were 18. They never had a job. But I went, I went through... Um, I went through all of that. I've been, I've been struggling. I lived in my car actually three weeks because I got kicked out from my parents' house uh, and I was going to the school and then I took a shower at the gym at school. Uh, I worked at a car wash uh, at the time to get some money so that way I could get my own place and I found a place for like $300 for like a little room. That was the happiest day of my life, I could tell you that because then I started, you know, like imagine living in your car for three weeks and I never lived in a car before when yeah. I was living in San Francisco, I mean, I was paying like know, sixteen fifty a month inside of a two bedroom apartment, like mm -hmm. for like a box. I was always That's thinking crazy. to myself for sixteen fifty, yeah. damn, I could buy myself a van, yeah, have rent free. I mean, that's a lot of cash spending on money. But yeah, dude, that must have been so cool just to get out of that situation. But you yeah. know what it's like. You've been on the downside, so oh, yeah. you appreciate I mean, the upside. Yeah, exactly. Like I, you know, yeah, I think my parents were like so strict. And it kind of built me up where I'm today too. Where are I'm, you from? I'm from Bangladesh. Bangladesh, and my dad is from Dubai, so I'm half like Asian and half Arab. So both of my parents were very strict. Were you raised there? <laughs> yeah, I was raised there. We grew up in a mud house. That's how like, and I didn't have shoes until I was five. So imagine like living like that in a third world so country. So a mud house is straight a house made of mud, basically, mud, basically. like basically. clay and mud. Clay and mud, yeah. And our stove was a mud too. Do you have memories from that? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I do remember a lot of things. Like, I know a lot of people don't remember their childhood, but I do remember every detail. Like, I used, to, I used to be best at fishing, so to get food for my family. So what I used to do, you know, the banana leaves, the middle part floats in the water. So I used to tie a string and then put a hook on it, get worms by digging the dirt, and I used to throw it in the water like a small lake. And the next morning, guess what? There was a fish on it. So I used to be really creative when it came to that. And then uh, at the time when um, the rice field used to get flooded, I used to have this uh, net. I used to catch a lot of fish and I used to sell that to the neighborhood people. And I was like, these are fresh. You can't get this on the market. 
So I think like that's where I kind of like got my entrepreneurship <laughs> journey from because I did a lot of things out of the way uh, that a small kid wouldn't do and uh, provided for my family at the time. Uh, my dad was never there because he was in Dubai uh, working. Um, he lost a lot of money over there. So that's why he came back to Bangladesh. And uh, we came here in 2002. Yeah, it was it was pretty. I mean, I had a crazy life. Like, How, how did home. the life compa- like compare in the sense you hear a lot of times that people in these third world countries in general, they yeah. build a much stronger relationship with their family members yeah, than definitely. say, you know, the t- typical American family. Do you think that's the case? Oh yeah, definitely. Like my brother, my oldest brother is 35. He still lives with my parents because he's taking care of them. Uh, we do build that relationship. Even our grandma, we don't put them in a, like a, what is that called? Like nursing, in a home. nursing home. They live with us until they pass away. So we have that strong connection where I know every one of my cousins, all 47 of them. you 47. 47 cousins. I know all of them. I know their kid's name. I know like uh, their friends, some of them, you know. So we do have that strong relationship um, where like we take care of each other. That's amazing. When my dad came here, um, my mom's family took care of him. They gave each gave him like $20,000 to start a business and then he paid him back. So the community actually comes together um like the families come together if they're doing well and then they help each other out and i think also in the jewish community they do that when they come from like israel they will like put money together so they can open up their own business and then pay them back amazing yeah well another whole aspect of what you do is is equally incredible and that's the whole drop shipping deal yeah now i don't think a lot of people really know what drop shipping is you know, when you think about businesses that you can get into that are, you know, relatively exciting, you know, you think of real estate, you think yeah. Amazon, you think drop shipping, you think, um, you know, now ATMs. Yeah. Can you kind of give a little bit about what exactly is drop shipping, and then you kind of segue how that relates to Amazon? Yeah, of course. I'll start off like with how I got started. Yeah. Um, so I was doing the ATM business, and uh, I didn't have a job anymore. I was getting bored. I was like filling up the ATM a week. The six days I was I was kind of off. So I, I wanted to get into something else because my business was all automated. And then I knew about drop shipping, but I never like really dove down in it, right? So I'll explain what drop shipping is. Imagine having a product. This is the cup, right? So this this is owned by, let's say, a reseller, right? A reseller will sell this for uh, $7, right? Then you have this product and you can ship it, ship it to someone directly from the resellers, right? Then you post this product without having it on Amazon for $10. That's what, 30% margin? Mm -hmm. So you're making $3 in profit if you get a sale. Once you get a sale on Amazon because you listed this product already, you go into the resellers, buy the product, and then ship it to the customer. You see what we did there? Mm -hmm. We never seen the product, we never touched the product, and it just directly ships to the customer. So then you're going in and physically placing the order. Exactly. For the reseller to exactly. sell it. And in the beginning, that's what I did. I have employees now doing that in Philippines. I don't know if you saw my video yeah. on Instagram. Uh, we have about right now about 40 employees in Philippines uh, that's doing that. That's working like really hard. And that's what you call project Wi-Fi. Exactly. That's, uh, that's our project Wi-Fi right now. We make basically Amazon store automated 100% for, the, for our clients. So... Um, so imagine doing this like 10 products a day, then you have a different product. You're doing 20 products a day. Uh, if you hit something in Amazon called buy box, you're selling that at least hundred times a day because Amazon will sponsor that product. Buy box? Buy box. So buy box is basically, let's say if you're ODR, which is like you order defect rate or reviews and everything is doing great on Amazon, Amazon will give you a surprise, meaning like they will take one product out of your store. They'll sponsor it with their own money or put it on like a recommended like if you buy a product, recommended buy products or sponsor on their main page or keyword if you put in, it will pop up. So it's basically like 40% to 50% of online sales are from Amazon. So imagine millions of people right now are Amazon.com. The crazy thing is that I get more sales from Monday to Friday because people are sitting in the office bored than the weekends, which is crazy. <laughs> So uh, Amazon has a lot of benefits, like you don't have to run ads uh, to get, get sales on Amazon. It's all organic. So there's a bunch of software that you can use online where it tells you like, hey, this is the product like that will sell. Um, there's also things that if you think about it, I'll give you a 
perfect example to find your first drop shipping product that will sell within 24 to 48 hours, right? Listen to this. In your lifetime, how many times do you think you will buy a a, um, a stroller? A stroller? Yeah. Mm. If you get lucky, maybe three times, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully one. So Hopefully then. one. Okay. So how many times do you think you'll buy a deodorant or, or a diaper? A lot. Well, yeah, I mean, let's take away the diaper example. Mm-hmm. We'll go deodorant probably okay. I don't know, I mean, once, uh, once, once a every month. Once every two months, Once right? every two months. Yeah. Exactly. So if you think about that, imagine the sales rate on that stroller versus the deodorant. That's a lot because a lot of people need that everyday product. That's the key word, everyday product. So like a shampoo or like a dog dog shampoo or whatever it is that people use every day, they ran out and they need to buy more. So you focus on, you know, products that need are consumables. Exactly. So uh, and there's a lot of profit in that because like if someone is in New York, right, let's say let's use Becky, right? Becky. Becky shout out Becky. Yeah. <laughs> Becky's 25. She's really afraid to go to the subway, go to a grocery store to buy that. And it's snowing outside. It's really cold. She'll order that from Amazon and get it in two days. And she will pay two, three dollars more for that product. And she'll buy that. People buy from my store right now. I'm selling water. I'm selling Gatorade. I'm selling like things that you could just go to the grocery store and buy it. People are so lazy nowadays. It's moving towards that era. Everything is going to be online. I could tell you, I will put my money on it. In 20 years, there's, no, there's not going to be any malls. People are not going to go to the malls. We'll have uh, like a virtual reality where you can go into a store, try things on that people will buy instantly. They'll get it in one day. Think about that for a moment because look where we're coming to. If people are buying water from Amazon, I think it's going to go that way. So right now you have your own Amazon store. Yes, I do. And that's just uh, your store and you sell multiple products. But you then ventured into this idea of teaching others how to build an Amazon business. Yes. And then essentially your upside here is that you make a cut on their overall sales or how does that work? Yeah. So I have two things. I have something called um, Amazon automation service for a client and I have my uh, mentorship. So I do have like an in-person mentorship and also online. And you see like people have courses. But a lot of people need a guidance, right? Even one of my students, if they, if I do have a course too, and they pay for it. And if they don't like open up the course, I call them. I was like, hey, why aren't you, you paid a thousand dollars for the course. Why aren't you opening the course? So if they finish three videos, I, I kind of like push them. You like call them up like, yeah, what's good? Yeah, exactly. Like it's, you paid thousand dollars, you know, should I make the course $5,000 so you guys can, you guys can uh, appreciate the course more because, you know, I did put my heart into it and I know I put everything into it. I, I don't hide anything when it comes to courses because I want to people, I want to see people su- be successful. Right. So, um, so talking about the two products, I have the course and mentorship and I have the automation where it, in this game is completely different. Uh, I haven't seen anything like this before. So basically, let's say you are our client. Uh, we'll take over your store. We'll do the product research. We'll add the item to your Amazon store. Uh, we'll add like your payment method and everything so you can get paid uh, when it comes to like, because uh, Amazon pays you every two weeks. And we do communication returns. We do every single thing. So imagine having a, your own Amazon business. All you're doing is pulling up your phone every day and looking at your sales. And we're handling everything in the background. The only thing we have to get done is a couple of things in the beginning, which is a setup process, basically. Is that annoying? The 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 setup like, process? Yeah. Not really, uh, because you have to think about how much money you're going to make in the right, future. Right, right. You know? uh, but it's annoying enough where people would pay for that to be taken care of. Yeah, exactly. So like, for example, something we do is called a tax exemption. It's a very hard process. Tax exemption is basically when you have a business, let's say um, you have a restaurant and you're selling uh, Coke. You're not paying taxes on the Coke because when you sell it, you're charging tax, right? Because you don't want to be double taxed. So when we buy a product from our resellers, um, we um, we don't pay taxes. That's how we increase our profit margin because you're reselling it. That makes sense. Yeah. So it's, it's a very like tough process, but we have uh, people behind it that does it for you automatically. What's the deal with Amazon reviews? Is it because I know there's certain lo- uh, rules against actually paying people to leave reviews or mm-hmm. you're not allowed to, but yet some people still do it. Yeah. They'll put like cards in there. They'll be like, hey, BT Dubs, we'll give you a gift card if you give us yeah. a review. Yeah. So um, that works. Um, 
but we like to get our views organically, especially if the clients like the product. So basically, um, Amazon, if they see you doing that, they can kind of like suspend your store sometimes, right? So they're doing it kind of like out of the way. So I wouldn't, if you have a product you're selling on Amazon, um, if you know you have a good product, I wouldn't like short sell it or like try to discount it or get a review. I would just uh, leave it alone and reach out to the client. Hey, if you're happy, leave us a review. That's it, right? That's it. Yeah. And it's a free review. If you offer them something to leave a review, it's against Amazon policy. So if they see you doing that, they can kind of suspend your store. Interesting. Yeah. And it's really hard to get your store back from Amazon when it's suspended. You have to get like an appeal. So I do appeals by online. Yeah. But we have like... 35 stores that's automated right now and uh we have zero suspended store Amazing. what we do the first three months we kind of like we call it the seasoning process the so seasoning yeah <laughs> so we cut uh, it's like a probation period amazon it is a trillion dollar company right they watch you like a hawk the first three months because amazon is known for their customer service right they're not gonna let anybody come in and ruin it so what they do they kind of review stores for three months see what are you doing and then they will it's very strict. The first thing. your chances of getting suspended is up to like eighty percent. The first three months. So the first three months, what we do, we send our products to Amazon and have them sell it, which is called the FBA fulfillment by Amazon. So we season the account that way for the first three months. Then we start the dropshipping process after. Is it the SEO that you guys do? Like, what what actually gets people to take an eye? So if I create a new store today, mm -hmm. I'm a new seller. I got no reviews, no swag whatsoever. Yeah. Obviously, you want to rank when someone clicks a certain search. Exactly. If something's too complicated, if you're on the second page, it's like you don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, what do you guys do there? So remember when I was talking about the everyday products? Yeah. That products, including having being the lowest seller on Amazon. So you know how on eBay. If you search for something, there's different sellers. Yeah. On Amazon with a different listing. So on Amazon, we search a product is one listing, different sellers on the side. And you'll see the prices. So if you're the lowest seller, you hit buy now, you're automatically getting that sale because you're the lowest seller. And you can make those margins. Those margins can oh, still yeah. be fat. Yeah. So what I do uh, with my virtual assistant in my store, uh, I have, let's say if I have about 100 products, they will go back into Amazon and they'll lower it to at least one cent behind the other seller. So that way I can get the sale. And they try to do the same thing, but like... Eventually it gets so low that the margins yeah. just aren't there. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of people don't even pay attention to that. So I take advantage of that because they're doing it on their own and have VAs monitoring everything. And I also have a software that catches that too, that changes the prices. Well, it's, Is it's, that a software you created or you use? Uh, it's uh, software is by web scraper. We know the owner. So he kind of made it like custom for us. Sick. Yeah. And it also tells us like what products selling on Amazon today, last week and last month. So we kind of do our product research from that. Interesting. Yeah. What I want to talk about the journey when you begin outsourcing this whole team to the Philippines. Yeah. Cause there's different levels of this entrepreneurship game mm -hmm. and, you know, getting to the point where you're running your own store, you're running your own business, you're doing it yourself is a massive level. Yeah. Anyone that gets there should be very proud of themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge step, yeah. but it's a whole nother step when you start bringing on a team and you start paying people and you yeah. become part of their, you know, overall welfare. How, what was that process like when you first brought in your first, say, VA, and then when you yeah. started expanding into the Philippines, then maybe why the Philippines? Yeah. And a little bit on that. Of course. Um, since I'm from a third world country, I know the struggle people go through, but you still see like a, like a smile on their face, even they're living like, like literally rice to beans, you know? Uh, that's what I would say, because that's what I used to eat, rice and beans all day, right? Um, I went through a lot of teams. Uh, I went through eight teams, to be honest with you, to find the right one. A lot of people, I interviewed them online. They seem like a good fit. And when I interviewed them, they sound good. Then when it came to actual work, they didn't really prove that, like, hey, what you told me on the interview, this is not, this is, you're not performing as much. So I went through a lot, right? Even one of my VAs suspended my store because he wasn't, like, really focused on the store. And... Uh, once I found the team in the Philippines, it was one guy at first, right? And he had a vision. He had a vision of like having his own business over there. He was already controlling a few Amazon stores. And uh, he showed me, he's like, hey, this is what I do differently from other people. And he used to work 12 hours a day in our store. And, and I went over there. I was like, hey, I want to do something for you. Oh, you um, flew out there. Yeah, I flew out there. 
and I was like, uh, you need to you need to build a team here because I really I really like what you do, but you can't be having five stores and running at the same time by yourself. So then he had friends that work for like customer support at Cisco or at Apple. So these these VAs are very smart. They have like bachelor and master degrees too, by the way. And for them, five hundred dollars a month is a lot. It's like making like maybe like twenty to thirty thousand dollars here a month, right? Um, and then I kind of had like passion for it because I wanted to have something in a third world country uh, where I can I'm helping others out. Do they speak English? They speak perfect English. Some of them don't even have an accent, which is crazy because they call customer support on Amazon, right? Um, so one of the things that I flew out there is because like I never been to Philippines and I was kind of excited to my VA team who has been working for almost like three or four months and kind of see them in person and and see how can I help them out to grow. Uh, then we start talking about like having the service for other people because on Amazon, you can only have one account under your social security. So that's why we had the automation service because a lot of people ask me, why don't you do everything yourself, make all your money, right, with different stores. But you can only open one Amazon store per, per person. So that's why we offer the service to other people. And, um, and when I went to Philippines, like, they were like the happiest people really? I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of got me like rolling. Like I had a fire in me. I was like, all right, I need to do something here. So then we start outsourcing different BAs, interviewing them, put them in action to see like if they can find me 10 products within an hour with at least like 20% margin. Uh, so we started uh, basically a company over there. And, uh, and a funny thing, uh, we got recognized by Manny Pacquiao's wife. So next time we're in Philippines, we're going to go visit her, which is crazy because she's like a really big entrepreneur over there. She owns over like 50 hotels. Yeah, she's a big deal. Mm -hmm. The whole Pacquiao res like yeah. that's that's a, yeah. they have their own empire. Yeah, and I think Pacquiao might be the next president because he's a senator already. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, a couple of things that stood out to me there is mm -hmm. number one, it makes a lot more sense the strategy you did it because mm -hmm. the whole idea of outsourcing, creating a compensation plan that makes sense for people and, yeah. and running it coherently is challenging. But yeah. if you can find one person that's really, really good, mm -hmm. they can become your right hand man. And exactly. you know, you're paying that person very generously. Mm -hmm. And you can say, Hey, look, I want you to go scale this team. Now you put the the torch in their hand, they're on the lines, you gave them a goal. And if that person's qualified, they can build it out for you. Exactly. And then you can go in and learn from them mm -hmm. as they're doing it. And now you're a team. Exactly. That's a that's, that's <laughs> a really cool way of doing it. Yeah. And another thing is that, um, when I usually work for a company like here, like Cadillac, Tesla, uh, when I sold a car, right, I was selling cars that were one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right, and I was getting like only two hundred and fifty dollars, right, for a sale. So imagine, I was like, if I'm an entrepreneur, I would never do this to my employees. I would actually give them part of the business, right. So, uh, and I realized I was like having my own deals. If I closed a a six figure deal and it's my own money. I keep to keep all of it and pay 20% in tax, right? Which is not bad, bad deal, right? And then uh, I started my VAs at $5 an hour. Then I realized, I was like, how can I put more fire in them so they can do like uh, $10,000 of sales a day? So what I did, I switched them, my store and my store that I'm controlling right now for other people to 70, 30 split. So now they own 30% of the stores profit. So now they're like working 10 times harder because they own part of that part of the business. So 30%. they're building a residual off of this. Exactly. So they're getting paid way more now. How are you managing all the finances with all this stuff? Uh, I have a software that builds up. Uh, it's projectwifi.io. Um, so the software itself does software it? Software itself does it. And the VAs has a spreadsheet. They put input everything from every sale, the profit margin, Amazon fees, shipping costs. So every single thing is on that uh, spreadsheet. So that way every month a client can log in or they can log in anytime in the spreadsheet and see exactly how much money they make today uh, for the last week or the last month. And then how much the, 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 the team made and everything. So exactly. it's super, your, your idea is keep it super in front of everybody. Exactly. Yeah. And if people are making $10,000 with my service, right? And have the VA. To, for them to pay $3,000 is, is nothing because they're making $7,000 in profit every month. How do all the taxes work when you're running this type of deal? 
Uh, so the taxes, uh, I do have an accountant and I recommend that to all my students. Uh, his name is actually Ecom Accountant on Instagram. Uh, very good guy, uh, very knowledgeable. I mean, he gave me free information when I needed it and I hired him for my store. So um, the taxes are not that complicated because you can create an, believe it or not, you can create an LLC elsewhere, uh, not in California, it's still running your business. You can have like a little PO box and then run that LLC so you can have it in like Nevada or Florida. And then you just have to know what to do because a lot of people it, that lives in California, they have LLC elsewhere. Like for my ATM business, if you're in California, you can create an LLC in Nevada. And th but there's like the six month rule you gotta be careful about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'm not a, like a tax specialist, so yeah. I would definitely talk to your uh, like tax people. And yeah, and just do that. Do That's that, true. like go to talk to your CPA. Uh, I mean, for them to, some of them gives you free information of how to do it if you do your taxes with them. Right. So find a CPA like that will do that for you instead of paying like everything up front. Because there's a lot of people that will, that will work, they will tell you and give you like free information as long as you do your taxes. What do yeah. you think like going through this experience scaling this team with Project Wi-Fi, which is just, I love the name. It's dope. Yeah. It's on your car. It's a, <laughs> you rep it so hard. Yeah. What do you wish you kind of knew before you kind of went through this whole scaling process that would have made it a lot more efficient saved you a lot of time maybe had you go through less teams before you found the right team or is it just a straight grind you just gotta find the right person uh so yeah you just gotta find the right person i would say i mean for me it took eight people right uh to go through them and some of them were teams and they were showing me results and everything from their previous store but it, it wasn't working out for my store so I think meeting them in person also kind of like made like, it realer hey. to them. Exactly, they're like, okay, this guy is this guy is not fooling around. He really actually wants to help. Like us. I can build my future with this guy. Exactly, exactly. So um, when I went out there, like like I said, they were the happiest people alive. Like it we became family basically. And I was telling the guy, um, which he's uh, my VA's name. His name is Joseph. I was like, look, next time I come here, I want to see you drive a BMW or a truck. Cause <laughs> you had a little car. Cause so the whole time I was motivating him, I was like, Hey, look, uh, I'm not playing around. I'm going to have clients because at the time I didn't have clients. Of course I was starting the company and I was like, you're going to, you're going to make so much money that I want to see you live in a big house. I want to see you drive, of course your dream car because I was living my dream. Why can I help uh, my main VA who's helping me with everything? I want to see him grow too. Cause especially like if I, have a business and they're the main part of the business right they're controlling everything in the background i want to see them win yeah i want to see them make money do you think people can see that in you and they say like wow this person's been through the struggle so that they feel like you get them more than other people um i i do get a lot of messages online they're like uh, when they see my car there's always oh, daddy's money even in person like i was like, in and out the other day and i was pulling out of the driveway and some kids, like young kids, they're like, oh, he must have daddy's money. And I heard it. I was like, they don't know the whole story, man. Like, they don't know the struggles I went through. They don't know, like, I was homeless for, like, three weeks. They didn't know I was living in a mud house when I was a kid, you know. A lot of people have so much opportunities here in America. Like, even if you live in Wisconsin, right, you have so much opportunity. You're living, like, maybe 10, 5 to 10% of the world because in other countries, they don't have these opportunities. Like, uh, for me, like, it's, it's crazy to see um, a healthy homeless person on one side of the street. And I see, I see someone who is um, like a lady that's like 40 years old and she's selling flowers to make money. It's crazy to see that for me because you have so much opportunity. Like, if you tell, there's so many people in my country right now would kill to come to America because they'll grind out seven days a week, save money and open their own grocery store. Like, if you if you realize I don't know like uh, if you go to like a little grocery store it's all my people that owns it like bang, bang they're from Bangladesh so uh, they kind of love that business because like a lot of people does it and there's a lot of good uh, like there's a lot of good money in it especially if you own your own store and they they work like seven days a week and when they get out of the store if you're a manager they go to Walmart and Sam's Club to restock like you know my brother does that right now my dad does that right now so it's a very good profitable business too but for me i want a different route because i want to have a, like a lifestyle that i really wanted to like enjoy right what does your dad and brother think about you 
Uh, at first, they didn't believe in me at all. They were like, oh, you're doing this thing with ATM and Amazon. Like, believe it or not, I still don't have my dad's location with my ATM on it. So that's, they didn't believe in me at first. I was looking, uh, one time, I was, I always tell this story to a lot of people. I used to look at cars because one of the things that motivate me. I want a Lamborghini one day. My dream car was a GTR, which I currently have. Uh, you know, since like middle school, I always wanted that car. So one time I was watching like a GTR videos of like shooting flames or something and it was racing another car. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get this car one day. And then my brother was like, you will never get that car. And then I used that as motivation. I think every single day I was like, I'm going to get this car. So when I got it, I pulled up to his house the next day. What did he say? He was like, oh, finally you got it. <laughs> Yeah, like I knew the yeah. whole time, but I was just yeah. trying to motivate you. You're like, ah, oh, yeah. Okay. But that's uh, that's one of the things. Like I would say, like those small things kind of build you up, like what you want to really accomplish. You know, like that that day when I went to go see the car with my best friend, I was supposed to test drive it. I wasn't supposed to buy it. But there's a difference between people that buy a car mm -hmm. than people that lease a car when they can't afford it. There's yeah. a lot of people that yeah. afford. You know, I did that when True. I was 21 years old yeah. because, you know, I hit, yeah. a, hit a six figure income. Yeah. Life was crazy. But I leased a 335 Beamer. Mm -hmm. That was so stupid. Yeah. Now, if I ever do that again, I'm going to buy a car and I'm going to be very well financially exactly. set before I even do that. Yeah. Even if you finance or lease a car, my best advice I tell people, especially entrepreneurs, because, of course, they want to buy the Lambo. Of course, they want to get the, the next Ferrari. Right. If you can buy it twice, don't get the car. That's my best advice. So if you're not liquid enough to buy that car twice, I wouldn't get it at all. Because think about it. Why would you buy a $100,000 car if you don't have $100,000 in your bank account? It doesn't make any sense. No. Yeah. Same thing with like buying a house. Like I bought a house in Miami. I still have it. it was the biggest loss I ever took because uh, like at that time I was like, yeah, I'm going to settle down, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to have kids. And I was like, that was when you're like 24, 25, 20, 26, I would say 26? 20, yeah, 25 around there. And I lost money in it. And every month I'm breaking even. Why did you lose money in it? Um, because the value went down on the, on the neighborhood. Um, and I, I had to do a lot of work because it's association. So every month something is breaking down every month. I had to fix something. So it's kind of like breaking even every month. So if I bought like multifamily, I would have maybe made more money. So that's what Grant Cardone does. I don't know. Like he has this call Cardone Capital where he gives funds to people like 3 to 6% every year, which is crazy because he makes way more of those multifamily units. Um, that's the next thing I'm going to get into is the multifamily units because there's a lot more money in it. So you don't have like those like, it sounds like you have a scar kind of from that experience with the real estate. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, like, like you said, I mean, you kind of learn from your mistake. I'm glad I made that mistake. Now I know what to do. Um, it's just like once once you have like a business and you kind of learn, you, you make mistakes and you learn from it. Uh, that's why also like people buy courses so they don't make those mistakes. So I wish there was a like, course that I bought that told me, hey, don't buy a single family house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The whole real estate game is is probably the most, I'd say it's probably the most talked about yeah. investment opportunity. I mm -hmm. mean, amongst the general population, True. you know, they think I'm going to get started in real estate. That's the play. Yeah. But yet still people don't know so much about it, but it's a lonely game from what I've heard about. I mean, you've had to spend a lot of money to get into that. And it's, yeah. it's a long time process compared to things like e-com and, and other factors. Yeah, it, it is. Um, it, with real estate, uh, it's kind of slow money. Like the, ma say. like the margins you just mentioned, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're making, if you could possibly make like uh, $2,000 on one ATM a mm -hmm. month, obviously that's a rare thing. Yeah. Anywhere between 400 to 1,000 is probably mm -hmm. more typical. Yeah. But that's almost what you're making on some of these multifamily homes, but you're not putting down like, you know, $50,000. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's the thing too, like with this traditional businesses, like also a lot of people like my ATM business, uh, or like the course, because it's not something that you see online. It's not all like, it's a hands-on business and people love that. And they know it can be passive. Tell me another business that you could break even on ATM in two months, yeah. three months. Even if you're doing like, let's say <laughs> if you have only a few thousand dollars, right? You want to buy a used ATM, you can buy a used ATM for like $800. And I did that before. What do you, what do you buy ATMs for? 
uh where yeah well um, not where but you don't have to tell me where yeah. i'm just saying like what do you buy them for like what's a really nice atm cost a really nice atm like two thousand dollars that's it yeah and then uh you can buy refurbished ones for 1500 and you could buy used ones for 800 to 1200 dollars which wow. is crazy to think that because it's gonna basically make you money as long as you own them and there's no loss in it because you can sell the atm you want i actually liquidated uh six of my location six times what it was making meaning like i sold it for way more money than what the atm cost but it was in a location already that was generating income so i sold it for about i think one of them the highest one was eight thousand dollars because it was generating about like seven hundred dollars a month so what's so interesting about this whole story and people don't have to not get this twisted is mm-hmm. you're 26 years old and you're kind of doing the, the typical path right yeah you have I'm the, 28 i was 26 when i started the entrepreneurship journey sorry right yeah, yeah. right <laughs> So, but back when you're, okay, so yeah. let's just call it 25. Mm-hmm. You're following that typical path and there's nothing yeah. wrong with it, but you know, it is, you're making a living. You're not really building your own business mm-hmm. and you're, you know, feeling like you're not making ends meet. You're probably a bit down on yourself, but you're seeing opportunity everywhere. And literally in the past two and a half years, you have gone from that mm-hmm. to this in two and a half years. That's insane. I mean, yeah. you have 40 employees, you have a team all over the world, you have two big old businesses, yeah. and you're just getting started. And I think a lot of it has to do with just you start playing the game. Like if people put more time and attention into building these type of opportunities, which is why I hope this podcast inspires them mm-hmm. to understand yeah. that, you know, Mo, though he's very you know sharp and he's making moves, is no much more different than you are, then I, I just think it's so possible once you start playing the right game. Yeah. I, th- I think it's, it's kind of like this. You can sit on the sideline long as you want. You have to get your foot wet. You have to get in the game. You have to push somebody. You have to get the ball, right? You have to kind of like put yourself in uncomfortable situations that you don't want to be in, right? Yeah. Like it's like going to the gym. You're doing the same thing every day. It's not going to improve. You got to do workouts that's different. That's your body is rejecting and your body's like, oh my God, this is like my arm is getting tight from this workout. I'm not going to do it again. See, that's the kind of things you want to put yourself into when it comes to entrepreneurship. When I lost money, I was like, I'm going to make that back because I had skin in the game. Now I know I'm not afraid. So, like the stock market crash, right? I'm buying, I'm buying left and right right now, right? I'm buying all the cruise line, airlines, all the oil company because I know there's going to be at least 50% gain in a few months, Right? So that's, that's the way I see the market right now. Like you have to take risk. A lot of people don't take risks nowadays. Take risk where like, you're not going completely broke. But if you tell me, Hey, I can make three times the money in this business. I will. Like I had a deal. Uh, this is in San Francisco. Uh, there's an area where a lot of people grow weed Mm -hmm. and I had a deal with a nice contract, $50,000 liquid cash. And in, Seven months, I was I got hundred ninety thousand dollars, and if I sold the weed myself, I would have got at least two fifty. So when I took that deal, I was like, I was like, all right, this is gonna work. I'm gonna put the risk. I did all my research. I looked. I the person that I invested in, I was I've been friends with them for like two years, and and other people did it, and I verified it, called them. But like, hey, is this what you did? And this is how much your return was, blah, blah, blah. And I took that risk. How do you, like, a lot of people wouldn't take that risk for that kind of return, you know? Because they were like, oh, it sounds too good to be true. Like, I was one of those guys a few years ago. Anything that I saw online, I thought it was a scam. And anytime I run ads now, some people are like, oh, scam. They don't know the ATM business. They don't even watch the video. That's that's what, like, kind of like a mindset I was in. I was like, I was like... I, I can't blame that guy because I was that guy a few years ago, you know? So it kind of crazy to see my perspective and see how people like, people are sometimes are so close-minded when they see an opportunity, like they will just say it's a scam. They think everything is a scam. Mm. But it, you realize like, you when it, I, I thought when I was working in 95, getting paid $15 an hour, I was literally living in a scam. <laughs> Like, if you think about it, if you get sick, they're replacing you the next day, right? And if you have, a, what I what I want to do, I want to have my business so far and up where even my grandkids are taken care of, then they can benefit from it because I want to leave a legacy behind when I die, right? So 
I want to I want to make so much money that I I don't want to see my family, because uh, like I said, like uh, like for me, like family means a lot to me, and we're very close, and I want to see like everybody live a good life. So that's why I I think I'm kind of doing this because I want to scale it to you know where I w- I want to become a millionaire one day, you know, yeah, and then maybe the next and maybe maybe the next generation will benefit from that because if I have a kid, I want ha- I want to. Uh, like him or him to have a business when they're like 13 or 15 educate them on credit educate them on uh like finance how to control their finance like they don't teach you that they didn't even teach me on my five year four five year degree in college what is credit never heard of that before until i was like 20 well they said the most expensive thing you can have is a closed mind yeah exactly so uh I, i don't know what's up with the education system in the u.s but I think they should have at least one course of teaching um, how to build credit. How can you leverage your credit to open up a business? How can you buy a house on your own, negotiate your own deals without hiring a real estate agent, right? Imagine doing that, you know? Accounting 101 without exactly. being an accountant. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it, it, it kind of crazy because I took so many classes online or in person I never use I never use those information in a real life situation. Yeah, it's like just it, an outdated system. Yeah, exactly. So that's why for me, I think college was kind of useless, except the experience. You know. Yeah, the Pythagorean theorem hasn't yeah. come in clutch. <laughs> yeah, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Exactly, and and it's crazy because uh, one of the things like um, was motivating for me. Also, I used to watch like a lot of blogs online. Uh, like even Logan Paul, I used to watch him a lot. I was like, if this kid is doing like stupid stuff to make millions of dollars, why can't I do it? That's one of my motivation. If David Dobrik is having fun with his friends and just recording with the camera and he's making millions of dollars, why can't I do it? Because I, I have the same mindset, right? I, don't, I, pro- I probably don't look like them, but I can get away with, with, with the business, right? And make a bunch of money. That's, that's the way I was looking at it, you know? Like, yeah, I used to watch, like, every single, like, every other YouTubers kind of motivate myself. Like, I was like, they, they go to the struggles too, you know? These kids are from, like, a small city, right? And they come to L.A. and they're killing it. And I was like, I could do that. Yeah, you believed in yourself. And people yeah. are doing that all the time. Yeah. L.A. has become s- such a hub. Yeah, definitely. But with that said, I am looking at Miami. I just was yeah. mentioning this earlier. I mean, you can't go with LA, Miami, or New York. Those are like the main hub, you know? You I think? I did like living in Miami, uh, but I feel like I couldn't like kind of like scale my network from there because I already knew everybody kind of, you know? And then I was like, all right, I need to move to LA because I used to come here like every other week and I just need to move here. Do you think that the overall amount of network like you mentioned is much bigger in LA than Miami oh yeah definitely Miami I would say since I've been living there since 2002 I kind of got bored too so I was like LA's yeah you've been there forever yeah exactly and uh and all my mentors was in LA too and you know networking event was in LA Vegas and if you think about it if you're in Miami you can only go to like Orlando for Disney World and you can go to Key West to go to the beach right yeah so we didn't have San Francisco. I can I can go to Mexico in like two hours if I want from LA, right? Two three hours. I could go to San Diego. I could go to U drive to Utah, you know, for like snow things like that. So yeah. and then I could if you need to fly, you don't have to have connection flight to go to Philippines. It goes directly there. That's go true. Go to China. And Miami all of doesn't that. have that. Miami, it's not a direct flight. You have to come to LA and go from here, or you have to cross like india or like dubai and then go from there interesting yeah (laughs) yeah where you live is uh, i get cold feet when i live someplace for too long Mm -hmm. i feel like i've lived in la now for too long yeah (laughs) Uh, so i'm just getting cold feet recently so i'm open-minded if anyone wants to convince me to come to their state let me know (laughs) that's good though because you're an entrepreneur as yourself right so um it's crazy like how you can say hey i'm gonna go to live in miami because a lot of people can do that right a lot of I know a lot of people can do that. Like I could do that. I could I could go to New York if I want to live for like like six months, right? That's the crazy thing about entrepreneurship is that you can move your stuff, go to another state, and just you, know, you have an online business and everything is working behind the scene while you're just traveling. You know, true. 
And I mean, for you, uh, Miami is a great place to live. It's cheaper than LA, definitely way cheaper than LA. You could live like 20 minutes outside the city, get a nice place for like $2,000 a month. And um, cost of living over there is not that much. If you And you could have a lot of fun in Miami. If you want to go jet ski, if you want to... I like, like the fishing deal there. Oh yeah, it's the a lot fishing, of fishing deal. Yeah. I'm uh, a big scuba diver too. So the, oh, nice. the reefs are much more accessible. Nice. Yeah, over there, like I go to a place called Dania Beach. Uh, you can go to like uh, spear fishing and things like that. I see a lot of people doing that. There's a lot of peers. Uh, one of the best things I love doing is pay 30 bucks and then going to fishing, deep sea fishing, and they give you the hook and everything, all the bait, and they set up everything for you. And if you catch anything, they even clean the fish so you could take it home and clean it. Yeah, it's that's amazing. Dope. Yeah, that's so dope. Yeah, <laughs> they got good tuna fishing, but you got to kind of like go like an hour, um, yeah, offshore to get. Oh no, there. not even hour. No, it's, I'm talking about in California. Oh, in California, yeah, yeah. Like over there like, it's like 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. so sick. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It looks like there could be the play. So Mo, mm -hmm. if you could go back in time and you mm -hmm. could have told yourself one, two or three things as a 21 year old, maybe right out of college yeah. that would have saved you a ton of time, money, headache, heartache. And yeah. it can't be, I wouldn't have told myself anything because it made me who I am today. That mm -hmm. was a great answer. Yeah. But if you could have thought about some things that you just wish you could have known, what, what were some of those things you would tell yourself? Uh, the first thing I would say is credit, right? So it starts with any business. A lot of people, we don't, we don't have parents' money. Not everyone wakes up every day and they can ha rely on their parents to pay for everything, right? So using credit, we have the best system in the U.S. That's, a, that's one of the things that U.S. did it right, is having the credit and getting a loan enough to open up a business. So I would say uh, when I was 20 on, if I was more educated on that, I would... and. If someone told me I can open a business just by using credit cards, it's crazy. Because um, uh, for me right now, I wouldn't buy a Louis Vuitton bag for like $3,000 with a credit card that I can't afford, right? I would go into a business, buy an ATM that would generate me money, buy assets instead of liability, right? So it's the same thing. Like when I, when I pay for something nowadays, I think about like, okay, is this going to make me money or not, right? Even my car, my car generated sales for me. Because a lot of followers that who wants a GTR follows me now online. What does he do? How can he afford a GTR? I get that question on TikTok all the time. And I build my I build my Instagram uh, like a brand. If you see it, I yeah. spend a lot of money in it uh, to try to get like more audience and things like that. So when I have a product, people are like, "Oh, this is what he does," you know. So that's one of the first thing. And second, I would say network. Network with a lot of people. Network with the grocery store guy, how did he open up his business, right? Network with your uh, relatives that are successful in the business. Get to know them more, maybe shadow them. One of the uh, greatest things that when I worked for Apple was we're shadowing people. Like when they were doing sales or they're the genius bar where you watch everything. That's the best way to learn. Yes, you can take a course, you can um, like learn everything on a book, but shadowing is a real life experience. Mm -hmm. You're seeing everything, you're hearing everything in person. So yeah, networking is the second, and you said three things, right? Yeah. Um, the third thing I would say, get out of your comfortable zone. Cause I was working jobs like that were like nine to five. I was just keep going and keep going to the job and do the same thing every day. At one point, I like, no matter who you are, you're gonna get tired, right? You want to do something differently that will set you up for a lifetime. True. And I did get out of my comfortable zone. I, I got bullied a lot in high school because I had an accent and I was short. I was the shortest guy in high school, um, and I think that kind of built me up where I'm today. I, I used to be one of those guys like you bully me now, but you're gonna work for me later. You know, <laughs> I still had that kind of mindset. I was like, I was like, okay, like. Uh, even in middle school through all high school, I used that as a, as a motivation. I was like, yeah, I'm getting bullied now. One day I'm going to be big. You know, one day I'm going to have people like that will recognize me at Walmart, you know, things like that. So uh, I think that's one of the things is uh, basically get out of your comfortable zone. You guys can hear it. I have a little accent. I used to hate it. But guess what? As soon as I started making money, I was like, I didn't care. I didn't care what people think of me. I didn't care if they think I'm short. It almost validated your confidence. Yeah, exactly. And if, uh, like coming to LA, right? Um, 
like a lot of things I was like uh should I go to a club because I don't look like a club person or should I hang out with these friends because I don't look like them you know what I mean like now I'm like whatever about it because I know what I'm worth and what I can do right so I don't look myself down anymore I had that self-confidence like um like a lot of people like they don't do things out of the way because they think like they're not part of their friend group, all right? They're not they're not good enough, right? That was, that's what I was trying to say. They're not good enough for those people. Get out of that zone, man. Like I've been there. Uh I I struggle with like what I look like. I struggle with like my confidence, even closing deals. I used to I used to be so shy in high school that I didn't even like talk to other people that like because I was in a comfortable zone. Like I was, I had a crush on this girl and for the longest time, and then finally I was able to ask her on prom. So I waited four years to ask her, I mean, ask her out basically. The Hail Mary prom yeah, ask. exactly. So it was so uncomfortable for me, but I was, like I said, I was very shy. I wouldn't say I was an introvert, but at the same time, like I felt that I needed to like do something out of the way, you know, kind of like get that confidence. So if you're getting uh, like when I did sales, right? I used to get a lot of no's. So uh, even, like I said, if you have a product, right? And you're trying to sell it. Oh, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. If you reach out to 100 people, you're going to get one yes. And that one yes will change your life. Because I use that as motivation. As someone else says yes, you know? So from that, you can build off of that. What, did, what mistakes did I make? Can I improve from that mistake? And I like to get a lot of people's feedback. Um, so, so that way I know like what I have to improve. Uh, one of the things that I learned also, um, is providing like, um, constructive feedback. Yeah. Right. And I love that because I learned working in my nine to five at Apple. So have you heard of 80, 20? Yeah. The 80, 20 rule. Yeah. I love that because like when, if someone took my coffee and drank it, I was be like, Hey, uh, I, I wouldn't directly ask them, why did you drink my coffee? I would say, I would let them speak 80% of the time why they took my coffee instead of accusing them of why they drank my coffee, right? They might have had a reason to. They thought they probably thought it was theirs, right? It was an honest mistake, right? So that kind of like builds relationship if you think about it, right? Yeah. Instead of like directly accusing somebody, let's say, you know, it's it's just like learning the human nature and the psychology of it. Instead of like, like telling someone straight like hey not why jumping did you do to that? conclusions exactly it, it works you know amazing yeah. those are some three solid yeah. pieces of information <laughs> yeah and you could go forever i mean you're just so yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do, should do part two <laughs> part two yeah. Uh, yeah there it is next time probably i will have my team with me uh we could talk about more about like the project wi-fi and stuff oh i would it's, love to it's, it's definitely like i have one client like he spent so much money he spent about a hundred thousand dollars trying to get into like entrepreneurship and and Project Wi-Fi is working for him. He made three thousand dollars profit within two months. Wow! And he's like, "Wow, I can't believe I've I found something." So what I did, I flew him out to California, and he lived with me for one week. And I showed him out around. We had a good time. Took him to Mexico, and he's like, "I never been to Mexico." We literally walked to, from the border, gave him the whole experience, the Tijuana experience, yeah, Tijuana experience, and he loved it. You know, so I now is gonna motivate him to go back home. And then maybe start another business because his whole business, Amazon business is now automated. And he, he trusted us to take over his business, right? So it takes a lot too yeah. for, for them to hand over their Amazon store to somebody and pay pay a lot of money to, you know, get invested into it. But you invest in your people and yeah. you see potential. Exactly. And when you see a good thing, you keep it. Exactly. If you tell me like there's an 18-year-old or 21-year-old who is really motivated to do uh, to start a business, I'll take you under my wing. If you reach out to, this is going to be posted on YouTube, right? Yes. So if you have the motivation, I'll take you under my wing, show you exactly what I do. Maybe we can work on something together, you know, to maybe open a business together. I would do it, you know, and I can, I can leverage that and also teach you a business that will earn income for your lifetime. And for me, it's right now, it's all about like building re relationship. I like, uh, there was a guy in uh, in 10x. I uh, he reached out to me. Happy guy, great energy. He was like, "Well, what do you want to do?" And he uh, he asked me that. I was like, um, 
I was like, I just came here to talk to people. He's like, oh, my goal is to become a billionaire. I'm going to become a billionaire in the next year. And I told him, I was like, what, what do you have plans for that? I didn't want to put him down. I said, what are your plans? And he didn't have any plan. And I told him, don't focus on the money. Never focus on the money when an entrepreneur start building relationship. Once you start building relationship with people, the money will come easy, easily. 100%. Yeah. Once you network with people, like uh, one of my mentors told me, it's like, I asked him, I said, how do I become a millionaire? Right. You know what he told me? He said, make me my first million. I'll make you a millionaire. <laughs> That's crazy. They, within those sentences, there's a lot of context behind it. But think about that for a moment. If you help someone, a millionaire, his first million, then you will become a millionaire because he will take you under his wing, right? If someone made me a million dollar, I'll be like, let's go. Let's go buy your car. I'll put a down payment on it, you know? So that's the way I see like building relationship, you know? The totally. money will definitely come later. Yeah. Sure. Mo yeah. University, baby. There yeah. it is. I love yeah. it. How can the people, if they just want to get more of the Mo in their life, how can people follow you and uh, anything else you'd want to add? Yeah, of course. Uh, they can follow me at Instagram. Uh, mo dot capital so that's m o e dot capital uh and then if you want to follow me on youtube it's called atm guru i do provide a lot of free information about the atm business in my youtube channel so you guys should check that out um this business could be for anybody single mom it could be a business for a uh, college student if you're like uh even if you're retired that's a really great business you know so it's that business for anybody. And that's the business that kind of fuel me to do other things. Yeah. So if you guys want to follow me there, that would be great. There it is. Yeah. Mo Capital. We appreciate you, Muhammad. You're of the course. man. We're definitely doing round two. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, bro. Until next time. All right. Thank you.